Hello everyone and welcome to COS, our course on commercial open source software startups. This course has three main parts. The first is about the software industry, its players and its economics. The second part is about open source and in particular commercial open source strategies for software vendors. And the third part is about how to spin off a commercial open source startup from your university. Each of these three main parts has four lectures, and this is the first lecture of the first part, and general introduction to what the software industry is and how it works. So I will be talking about its history, the main players, and then about some economics that make the software industry tick. To get started, let's ask what is uh, software. You may think about it narrowly as a set of instructions that make a computer do some work as the result of programming, some binary or even the source code. Um, but that's really just a very technical perspective. In this course, we will take more of an economic or business perspective. So in that respect, software is a digital good that can be sold. So because it can be sold, you can make money and so forth. It's a good. And it's pretty much everywhere. It's in your navigational systems. It runs your mobile phone. It lets you uh, uh, play games. It operates various devices, small ones, large ones, whole factories. And it is just pure software, not necessarily connected to devices as well as stuff on the web as uh, social media, for example. And uh, it is really fundamental to the modern world. In all of this, what you just saw, uh, software exists as a product. So a product is a man-made artifact uh, that's being sold to customers in a market. The underlying idea is that there is this product which cookie cutter style can be replicated and repeatedly sold without much variation to a market, including many customers, not just one. So if that's a product in general, then a software product is such product, but more specifically a product that is pure intellectual property. It's wholly virtual, it's not physical, which has some nice properties. It doesn't rot, for example. And also, sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. Uh, creating that second copy, copying a piece of software, has close to zero costs, really. You can make perfect digital copies of software uh, at no cost, really. And then software, unlike physical products, software as a product or software itself, is extremely malleable. You can give it any very form or shape as long as it's virtual and runs on your computer. Now then, our software products are created and provided and operated by the software industry, sometimes the IT industry, though that's often a bit more broadly viewed. The software industry is, in my definition here, the set of businesses that provide software products and software services where software services can be operating the software uh, for you, which can be consulting services, where I distinguish between regular development, custom code you're writing, and implementation services, where you take a piece of software and customize it uh, for your particular customer. So that software uh, um, that the software industry creates is directed at itself and any other industry. No industry today, whether logistics, automotive, fashion, beauty, what have you, uh, the movie uh, makers, uh, Hollywood studios, they all need software. So software, the software industry cuts across all other industries. The software industry is highly concentrated, meaning uh, there are large winners and it's not as diverse as some other industries. It's highly internationalized because software knows no boundaries. Um, you can make it work with some effort 
in all the different jurisdictions on this planet, typically. And it comes with strong network effects, as we will see. Software connects with other software and may work better because of that or may work less well because of that. Uh, so network effects are strong in the software industry. It also has a high speed of innovation, perhaps the highest speed of innovation than any other industry because it's all virtual. The time from making a change and having that change create economic value can be zero, as we will see in a few slides. And at present, the software industry really is um, expanding into new domains. One could argue it's coming into its own, well, but maybe it has been uh, like that for a long time. But now, as one famous uh, venture capitalist uh, said it, uh, software really is eating into all other industries, is eating the world. In terms of uh, money to be made, and you can see some figures here uh, in the 2019 to 2021 our time range. Um, given that we just faced the corona pandemic, there's probably some, uh, some consideration to be had as to do these figures really ex extrapolate, but you can still get useful information. You can see on the left the different sub forms or sub parts of the overall industry, running data center systems, providing selling enterprise software, providing selling devices, IT services for devices and data centers and what have you, the communications uh, services and so forth. When you look at uh, the 2020 and 21 projected growth of uh, a few percent, 3.4, 3.7, given the base on which it's growing, uh, billion, this are, this, the 2021 spending is expected to be 4 trillion US dollar, uh, growing at 3% or more on that base is just enormous. That is a huge amount of money. It's easy to grow strongly on a, a small base, but at this huge base that the software industry already has, even a few percentages are big. And here he is, uh, Mark Andreessen, a famous venture capitalist, original uh, co-developer well, among several of uh, Mozilla, um, the original web browser, and uh, he quipped software is eating the world, a nice statement by which he meant that software really is in every business. There is going to be no business that does not have a software angle to it. And then the question becomes, uh, which part of a product is the dominant part, is the competitive differentiator, is why customers buy. Think about a car. Uh, are you buying the car because it's got this metal or are you buying the car because you can listen to uh, some music streaming service while sitting on the passenger seat? Probably neither. You need to think about it more abstractly as either something that gives you joy of driving or more prosaically something that gets you from A to B. And then within that value proposition, how important is the metal, how important is the gears and motor, and how important is the software. And that will determine who for this product is in, the, in this case a metaphorical driver's seat and is more important for the companies who produce that uh, product. Uh, the original Blechbieger or the new software developers. We will see. This was the statement by Andresen was picked up by uh, various companies. Here's a now former uh, CEO of uh, GE who uh, agreed uh, that they not only need to be in the information business, that's the nice screenshot I got here, but really also quipped that GE needs to be a software company. I don't think he meant exclusively a software company, but he already nevertheless put software on equal footing with all the other stuff that GE is doing from machinery, uh, consumer devices, all the way to finance. Software is right there among them. 
And there are good reasons for thinking hard about your software strategy. Um, as I just said, it's simply part of the product. And so I trust that uh, some products are much better because of the quality of the software. And so software does become a competitive differentiator. I think that uh, you would not buy a car without a navigational system these days, no GPS. And so that is a part of it. Um, so you cannot ignore it. But there's a corollary, or I'd like to say a derivative of uh, Andresen's statement about software eating the world, which is that software increases the innovation speed madly and that this needs to be taken into account. So why does software make innovation so much faster? It's what I just said a few minutes ago. Software is so malleable, is so fast, it's all virtual. There is no physics or very little physics that stops you from being fast. So a programmer who writes some code with the right tooling, with the right continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline can have their work, the newly written code, do the job it's supposed to do within seconds or minutes. So there's a very, very short time lag from you're doing paid work and it's generating revenues potentially for those who pay you. Um, there's a very small time lag. Compare that with traditional industries, say the car manufacturers, which will deliver a new car, uh, a new model uh, in 12 month intervals. So 12 months to the innovation until it starts making money or seconds or minutes until the innovation makes money. And obviously software outpaces, outruns in terms of innovation, every other product category. And hence companies are looking at the architecture of their products and are looking at how can I take advantage of this incredible speed of innovation that software gives us. How do I have to re-architect my product so that as much as I can is in soft, as, as much as I can make it work is in software and can have this innovation speed so that I don't have product release cycles of 12 months any longer, but possibly in minutes. And that is again the first derivative of software is eating the world and a fundamental change to all these non-software businesses because now of the software in there. Beyond these direct economics, uh, economic effects, uh, software obviously is super important uh, in exactly that speed I just mentioned to uh, have an effect on our personal life, um, our communication patterns, our media consumption patterns have changed drastically over the last 10 years. There clearly is also a danger of abuse uh, by, say, surveillance, AI, um, by uh, um, misuse in social networks, um, and so forth. Whatever way it turns, internet and email are basic utilities and uh, they are just important now nowadays as to how the society organizes itself and we have to handle that. Now, before I detail, go into more detail on these various aspects, I would like to uh, provide a very short a history of the software industry to help you understand where we are today and where we're coming from. And software compared with other industries is obviously fairly recent, young, and the first time software was mentioned was around 1959, I believe. And then in 10 years later only, there was the recognition that software and hardware are separate things. Initially, software was closely tied to the hardware. Increasingly, it was decoupled, for example, to gain these uh, speeds that I talked about and not tie everything down in hardware. And this distinction, this conceptual distinction was turned into a business distinction by the US Department of Justice in 1969. And that meant that hardware and software could be sold separately and that the 
could be the requirement that you buy a piece of hardware and you should be allowed to run other software other other vendors other provider software on it that was perhaps the birth of the software industry over the 80s 90s and so forth we had changes in architecture of products we went from the initial vertical integration to horizontal integration which is still dominant on your laptop but increasingly now uh, going back to vertical integration in the form of cloud computing stacks we saw economic effects like the growth of platforms and associated ecosystems and we saw how much of the software industry is a winner-takes-all market with for example in the 90s the significant dominance of Windows until now later Linux and then Android uh, took that some of that dominance away from from Windows open source software really came into its own um, perhaps only over the last 10 years but certainly already had a uh, strong boost during the 2000s the noughties so until the 80s uh, the, in the early days of software when it was always closely tied to hardware you could buy vertically integrated systems meaning you would go to one vendor like IBM or back then another one called DEC Digital Equipment Corporation and you would say give me a computer and what you meant is the hardware the computer but also the operating systems the business applications you needed and whatever services were needed to make all of that work for you in your business and companies vendors competed on these full stacks so you would either buy from IBM and nothing else were or you would buy from digital equipment corporation and nowhere else and uh, these were the so-called vertically integrated stacks uh, that changed in the 90s when people realized that it's really really hard to have high quality components on each of the logical layers you just saw so there was already a recognition that there's some layering structure to, uh, to um, hardware and software. Clearly a distinction between hardware and software, but even within the software, you could recognize the difference between a database system and an operating system and a business application. That didn't happen naturally. That had to come out. So 20, 30 years ago, maybe people didn't see it so clearly. Well, 30 or 40 years ago. Now, in the 90s, people realized that if you had these layers and then had well-defined interfaces between these layers, then maybe different companies could specialize in writing components or software on these different layers. And you would be able to pick and choose, taking a so-called best of breed approach as a customer, you could choose which hardware you wanted from one vendor, an operating system from another vendor, didn't have to be the same vendor as the hardware vendor, and an application from yet another third vendor. And that worked, or was supposed to work, because of well-defined interfaces, partially enforced by politics. Um, so you can see how hardware could be IBM laptops at some point in time, maybe Lenovo now, Dell or Samsung, operating systems, Windows, Linux, OS X or Android maybe on a mobile device. And applications would be Word or GIMP, an open source Photoshop alternative or Twitter as a web service. Now, we will see quickly, of course, there are bundling effects, meaning that Microsoft Word and Windows for the longest time work together really well, not just coincidentally, that's because they are from the same company, obviously, and that competing applications to Word would not run as well on Windows. So clearly, these interfaces are never, never as clean and perfect as you would want them to be. But lo and behold, for the biggest part it actually worked and it did work among others because of a platform idea where a lower level would be or lower layer would be supporting the higher layers leading to platform dynamics which i will be discussing a bit later after i finish this history part 
Now this horizontal uh, integration rather than vertical one was dominant in on the laptops and data centers as well, so new workstations and data centers as well, but is increasingly changing again thanks to the advent of the hyperscalers, the big providers of public clouds like AWS and GCP, Google Cloud. And those are in some sense back to vertical integration because they have full control over the hardware, uh, the operating system and then platform services that run on top of it. And um, they, because they have full control, it's not the customer or user who puts them together, can of course focus on making them work together really smoothly. To the extent that we see how some of these are clearly getting custom hardware built for the data centers and not using the same off-the-shelf components any longer that maybe um, the normal person has at home. AWS doesn't really do much applications, but Google Cloud does uh, some, for example, in Gmail, which you might, which you might know. So uh, we have a step back to vertical integration, but only because now the operator of the software is the same who puts it together. While previously um, uh, the IBM stacks or DAX stacks would have to be operated by the customer in their own data center. This new world of cloud computing is amazingly bizarre and complex. And it's obviously where the action is these days. Here you can see the Cloud Native Computing Foundation's landscape picture, a recent one of the components you might need to run a proper or full uh, Kubernetes uh, install. Um, probably not everyone, not every of these tiles, uh, but many. And so uh, running a cloud, running Kubernetes uh, can get quite complex, which is why you like to buy it as a service, uh, perhaps from the hyperscalers AWS, GCP, and Microsoft Azure, uh, most notably. So uh, over its lifetime, the uh, software industry has had its booms and bust, busts. Uh, the most notable one was the first real bursting of a bubble of the dot-com bubble around 1999, 2000. You can see how people went crazy here in this depiction of the NASDAQ Composite Index, uh, which holds most of the tech stocks. You could see how it peaked between 2000 and 2001 in terms of the value of the uh, companies totaled on that NASDAQ in that index, and then rapidly fell. Um, it rapidly fell until uh, going, going back to maybe 1996, 1997, uh, days after which it recovered. It was a sobering experience for those who lived through it. Uh, but since then, the um, uh, bubble, the burst bubble has been made up and overtaken already substantially again. Look at this long term perspective on the tech stocks, the NASDAQ composite index again. You can see the bubble. Um, at, uh, at around 2000 and the blur and how it felt, falls from 5000 back to a bit above 1000 and then recovers. And what looks kind of like a linear recover here after 2000 to 2020 is actually an exponential scale. So it has been growing exponentially and now is at at least twice the, uh, the height of the dot-com bubble 20 years uh, later, despite uh, Corona. So the software industry, uh, like every industry, has different players, meaning different types of companies, uh, businesses in there. So for one, there are the standard product providers, uh, used to be just the vendors, but now it also includes the cloud service providers. Classic software vendors are those who sell you uh, some piece of software to use in your data center or your workstation. And the cloud service providers 
or simply sell you a subscription to their software that they also operate for you. In both cases, it's products. Despite the name cloud service, it's a cookie cutter product they are making available to you. It does not correlate with labor time by people spent on it. That would be the second category, software consulting firms. That's where mostly customers pay for labor, people's time. And there are two subcategories. There's the original development, where you're really getting custom software developed. And then there are the implementation services, those who take an existing enterprise software, for example, and only customizes. They're not developing something new. They just make it work for you, for example, by tying in the enterprise software into your Active Directory, LDAP, what have you, whatever company directories so accounts are known, tie it to your database system so backups is working and so forth. Beyond these two categories of uh, for profit businesses, there are non profit organizations, um, governmental and non governmental. And the three most important ones are those who give us standards that we have to comply with, those that uh, regulate the industry by posing requirements and ensuring that those requirements are met or you lose the right to sell your product. And then those who, um, who may certify you for compliance with standards and regulations. In this course, we are particularly interested in software vendors. And so a lot large part of it uh, will be, of the course will be about software vendors because that's what usually constitutes startups, at least the Silicon Valley type of startup. Um, here you get an idea, you have a list of uh, the biggest independent software vendors in 2019, independent meaning they are their own, their own company, not owned by someone else. And as you can see, Microsoft is leading before Oracle, before SAP and so forth. And these are large, highly valued, valued, valued by the stock market companies. You can also see there almost all are US-based companies and not just US-based, Silicon Valley based. So Palo Alto is a city in Silicon Valley and Northern California and uh, the others are not that far away. Only two from two from Europe, SAP and so. Um, this may have changed quickly with the ad, with the rise of Chinese uh, companies, but um, here for now are the 2019 largest software vendors selling products to a market for the customers in their market, and they also dominate the tech stock indices because Microsoft, Oracle, and SAP are just at the top up there. It was still vendors, meaning it did not count the so-called internet companies or what I call cloud service providers. Those somehow fall into a separate category, even though in my book, they also sell products. So software vendor is somehow turning into the more focused term of license sale while web service cloud sale as a subscription sale. I'll come to that in a bit. And so we have this other category of web service companies like Google, uh, Facebook, and well, even uh, Apple to some extent. In both cases, whether it's uh, one of these internet service providers um, um, or classic software vendor, they sell you a product. The terminology maybe still needs sorting out, but the key here is they sell you a product, cookie cutter style, comes a new customer, they get a copy of what's already there, logically speaking, and it's not custom development. You do not have to hire more people to satisfy a new customer. They just get the same product uh, like everyone else. And um, increasingly, they're just merging. Yeah? Microsoft is as much a cloud vendor these days as is SAP and uh, the others. So probably that will just, under a new name, just become their cloud computing companies. What we need to understand, though, is that products do not work without projects. By this, I mean that 
the type of products we are talking about here, which are enterprise products, are so complex that if you give them to a company by download or on a DVD or a large set of DVDs, um, you will uh, not help them. Your customers still need to put the software to work. And unlike on your consumer laptop where you install the software and expect it to work, taking a large enterprise software like say SAP Business Suite um, and putting it to work is a long process. It's illustrated here and it then brings in the consulting companies which do projects for you and only at the end do you have running software. So here I illustrate uh, the process from buying an SAP license, buying the right to use the SAP Business Suite software until it actually starts working for a customer. It's a bit over the top here in this illustration. Not, you wouldn't necessarily do it like that, but it shows logically the different parts. So at the root or at the beginning is the original software vendor, SAP, and it sells you, the customer, a license to use its main flagship business software, business suite, the original S3 ERP, now business suite for a long time. Before you can use it as a company, you need to adapt it to your workflows. SAP is often bought because it gives you standardized workflows. Companies buy because they just want the standard workflow that everyone else has, assuming that it's a good one. But on those parts where your main where your own main business is, you need, you want your own business processes, your own workflows and not everyone else's workflows. So 90% of businesses are standard business as usual, not exciting, but the 10% that are specific to your market, specific to your capabilities, those need to reflect your unique abilities and they will not come with a default SAP system. So you need some consulting company here development services to program workflows for SAP that reflect how you go about your business in the way that it reflects your competitive advantage uh, to your competitors. So the first step of putting SAP to work is have code written that reflects your workflows, uh, your business processes. Uh, that used to be ABAP code, increasingly you're able to model it, it's all the same. You're describing or modeling or coding the workflows and business processes you need for your business. Then comes the second step, logically a separate project, where you take the software and uh, adjust it to your operating environment. Um, even if, so that used to be your own data center, but even if you use a public cloud, you still have to hook up that software with your internal company directory, with your security precautions uh, and how people authenticate and get authorized and so forth. So there's a second level of uh, consulting projects, which I call implementation services here, which takes the standard off the shelf software SAP plus its customizations and extensions by way of development services and ties it into the infrastructure that you want it to run on and use with. And so that could be a second, uh, second consulting firm. Often development services and implementation services are given to the same firm as a project. Why, why split it and make life more complicated? I split it here logically so you see the difference and logically it is two separate things. Finally, someone needs to actually run the software for you. That could be your own data center or you go into someone's cloud. Increasingly, you could go into the original vendor's cloud as for example, SAP is also trying to or actually becoming a cloud service business, a cloud vendor. So you don't have to run SAP on T-Systems hardware anymore. Um, we could run it on SAP hardware or whatever, wherever hard SAP gets its hardware from. And that again, this operations again, then is more of a product. So you have a product at the beginning, two consulting or projects in the middle, and then some sort of standardized operations, more like a product at the end. Hence, 
So these things need to come together before any value is generated for, for the customer from the enterprise software. If you don't have all these four parts, there is nothing you gain. Uh, you pay and you don't get anything out of it. So you need all of this, which is why in the software industry, product companies, the vendors like SAP and consulting firms like Tata and Accenture coexist nicely. They need each other for business or there would be no business. Then we have the standards organizations, uh, sometimes non-governmental, but often governmental, um, uh, which standardize um, uh, certain topics, protocols, network protocols, um, interfaces, APIs for interoperability and so forth. And uh, the idea of a standards organization is that whenever people comply with a standard, whatever they provide, the product is compatible, plug compatible uh, to anyone or with anyone or any software component that uses that standard or programs say against an API. So one party has a product that complies with the standard and another party has a product that needs a component that fulfills the standard and then they ideally become plug compatible. In practice, um, that is sometimes the case. Standards usually work if the vendors want to work together and that's usually only the case if the standard or the software around it is really just costs and not competitively differentiating. But as soon as being superior behind the standard means real money, it will be hard to, to really have a well-defined standard because then um, uh, the companies helping define the standards will almost always try to introduce loopholes, leave open things for enhanced quality of service, what have you, which will make things incompatible and thereby lock uh, the user of the standard into a particular product because they inadvertently relied on something more than the standard because the standard had holes in it. A typical example was the requirement to standardize the file formats for Microsoft Office documents and uh, that was always a nightmare because obviously Microsoft did not want anyone uh, to compete with Microsoft Office. So uh, locking in users by uh, tying them to the file files that you created and not being able to easily switch to other processes, for example, was a time-worn strategy. By far not the only company who does that. So examples of standards organization is the ISO, the International Standards Organization, and in Germany, for example, the VDR, the uh, the automotive industry. And they organize <laughs> to make sure that the state does not do it for them. Then you have the regulatory bodies. So these are actually the government agencies usually on state level, federal level and so forth, which ultimately do design and um, bring to fruition laws and directives that regulate how the industry works. Often that is standards and standards compliance, for example, in the, in the space of safety and security in order to protect consumers. So um, the FDA uh, in the US and uh, equivalent agencies in Germany would be uh, a good, good example. They not only um, help form laws, but they enforce them. Uh, they watch over the industry. They don't necessarily get to tell the industry what to do, but they could either not approve products or they could sue. They have a mandate to sue those who are not complying with the required uh, standards. Finally, there are the certification agencies. These are usually uh, nonprofits, uh, but often usually are actually not governmental organizations. And what they do is as a product vendor who needs a certification, 
that say your product complies with a standard so that a regulatory body approves your product for use in, in practice in an industry. You go to a certification agency and submit your product for certification. Or it could be product certification, does your product meet certain, uh, certain qualities? Uh, or it could be a process certification. Uh, did you follow a certain process as you developed it? So there's an assumed quality about your product and so forth. Certification agencies, even students sometimes get to see. There's a whole, um, there's the Scrum world, for example, where you have um, various forms of certification in becoming a Scrum master or so. So that is personal certification. Uh, supposedly certification because good certification rests on a system of three distinct parties. One is the standards body who defines the curriculum or in the case of say scrum training in general the standards to comply with. Then there's a trainer who teaches you or companies how to comply with those standards and finally there's the certification agency who um, will give you a mark or certify, certify you for compliance with the standards. Uh, with the standard. And as soon as these are not three separate parties, like is the case with the Scrum certification, those who define the curriculum are also certifying you. Um, you have conflicts of interest and the certification will not be worth that much because it's not independent. It is a conflict of interest that drives the quality of the certification lower and lower. But where it's important and where it's real and where it works, these three parties are separate entities so that the conflict of interest is maintained. So um, so I've been talking about the software industry and its players in general. And now I want to dive into uh, software products, later software vendors um, as well, because that is where startups happen. When we talk about software products, um, we need to distinguish various aspects. Perhaps the most important one is the most coarse one is the category of software. And that would be by who you're aiming at from a business perspective. Who is your customer or where, where are your markets? And the most coarse category is a distinction between consumer and enterprise customers or markets. Consumer or enterprise software. They are very different. So different that rarely do you have a company which caters both to the consumer and the enterprise market because these types of customers are so different that you usually specialize in just one of them. The key distinction really here is consumers are really price sensitive. You and me at home, we do look at the price of something and might be willing to use our own time uh, to get a cheaper deal or accept some inconvenience and pay for it with our time and so forth. While companies, enterprises as customers, enterprise customers, have a much more rational perspective of this, are much more willing to pay for a better product if it really saves them time and if they uh, can focus on their own business and generate uh, revenue from it. That's probably then the difference that enterprises use software products uh, to generate revenue while retail customers just use it as a convenience at home watching TV or what have you and so we are not making any money off it so maybe that's why consumers are more price sensitive and less rational perhaps than enterprises. You can see that here now the distinction again consumer products are comparatively cheap while enterprise software can easily cost millions it uh, is usually uh, aligned with the value that the software creates for customers um, consumer products are often free and then subsidized effectively by 
um, other form of compensation you the consumer pays for example with your attention or your data uh, let's assume Facebook is free to use but you pay with your time and attention and the data you generate that Facebook makes money off but uh, that's different for the enterprise software the enterprise software is the product itself customers buy because they want that software and they want to use that software and that's it markets so the consumer market is a huge market and the enterprise market is a huge market again these are the most cost categories but markets can be segmented into sub parts sub markets or market segments as they are called and for consumers that's usually demographics uh, for example you can split by segment by age by gender uh, lifestyle what have you in the enterprise world you have two main ways of segmenting uh, so-called horizontals or verticals or by horizontal slicing or vertical slicing which means either by business function businesses customer businesses all are somehow similar or by the industry there are lots of different industries that you could specialize in and then uh, consumer products really need to work out of the box because few consumers are willing to pay for consulting services to make the software work for them while that's different for enterprise software as explained enterprise software by its very nature is often so complex that you absolutely cannot do without the consulting projects that make the product work well for you and hence whenever you budget for enterprise software you will always almost always have to budget in the costs of turning a heap of bits into actually usable software by way of implementation projects as mentioned consumer the consumer market is segmented in various ways for example by a loose age group here or other status that is not mutually exclusive here so that's just an illustration the enterprise software market has these horizontals and verticals and again the horizontals are the business functions CRM customer relationship management that's sales helping sales effectively SRM is supplier relationship management that's uh, purchasing and so forth and these are different business functions that exist in pretty much every customer company every company out there of some size probably certainly needs probably already has these days customer relationship management software uh, crm was hot 20 years ago the market may still not be saturated but um, it's uh, it's getting there and then you have the verticals again these are the different industries so here are a couple of examples healthcare banking insurance or financial services energy automotive and so forth and these are just different industries with very different needs and the specifics of the industry inform the enterprise software and how it works you see a couple of examples here salesforce is for example a crm software vendor um, operating the software for you in its own cloud same thing for human resource management that would be workday another of the newer cloud vendors um, operating software for you focusing on a horizontal Avalog is a Swiss company providing banking software so it specializes in financial services primarily banking doesn't know anything about automotive but then goes across all the business functions integrates the software into one for banks and uh, integrate CRM, SRM, ERP, HRM and so forth. One might think that industry verticals are dominant but I'm not so sure. I think industry horizontals in general are doing better and are a better guess because it allows customers, users with added effort but it allows them to choose best of breed and uh, it's like the original horizontal integration you just integrate a different crm system and a different srm system a different erp system and really get the best software in each horizontal 
while a vertically integrated uh, enterprise software um, may be specific for say banking but will find it hard to really excel in all of the business functions and therefore it might be hard to compete with anyone specializing in that particular business function the vertical uh, the, hor the uh, horizontal in terms of industry lingo the way industry talks about things uh, industry always wants to buy a solution that's a funny word um, if uh, what it means is industry or customers do not want to buy products they want to solve a business problem so salespeople and the industry has adopted these words they are selling you a solution to your try to sell you a solution to your problems rather than a bunch of products and that has uh, worked out well in particular for those who provide the integrating services because if you um, want to buy a new application or multiple and they all need to work together again you need these projects consulting projects to make them work together and uh, so it becomes a complex deal where you not only buy possibly new hardware and an operating system and then the software that delivers the business value you also need the consulting service to put it all together and put it all to work for you the non-IT company usually who needs others to get it to run for you and that turns it into a solution and then ideally of course our customers really just buy from one provider from the IT industry the whole solution rather than having to deal with all four of them because if you do the later then well if something goes wrong they'll all be pointing fingers at each other and then if instead of buying from four different parties you bought from one which made an integration promise then you know whose uh, throat to choke as the industry saying goes so you try to buy everything out of one hand even if behind that are hiding different vendors all right two final important economic topics software platforms and software ecosystems so software platform um, is something that makes your application run when you think about software you would first think all i need are applications because the application let's say a uh, crm software for sales that's where i get my value from but as we saw earlier, uh, during the days of horizontal integration, um, people realized you can build and have better software if you view the architecture of systems uh, in layers, where there's a clear distinction between an operating system and a business application on top of the operating system. And ever since, uh, using this example, there has been a separation of responsibilities on a technical level between what an application does and how an operating system supports an application. As a consequence, if you write, if you program an application today, you don't program against the bare metal usually, but you program against an underlying operating system and assume that this operating system is there. And hopefully it is, because otherwise the application then wouldn't run. And you also don't want to be programming all the functionality that the operating system gives you yourself. At the same time, an operating system also standardizes a set of functions so that, we'll come to that in a second, the users can run different applications on the same operating system, which provides the same services and functions to these different applications, and it hopefully runs smoothly. So an application, a software that delivers the business value that you want and um, usually you don't have anything on top but underneath thinking in terms of layers the application are platforms at least an operating system system also often a database system which can also be considered a form of platform etc so platforms are software that you build on uh, from an application perspective that give you valuable functionality that you don't have to program yourself so you're faster developing your application but those platforms themselves have no economic or immediate economic value to 
uh, the user of the application. They only exist to support the application which delivers the business value to the user. And so they are not usually directly vis visible uh, to, the, uh, to the user unless they have a window manager or what have you to start applications. But they are usually not so prominent because users work through applications with the system. Now then, if you've listened to the industry, um, read trade magazines and so forth, you know the word platform is just everywhere because everyone wants to be a platform, which makes no sense because the application is where the business value is. That's where customers are buying. Or is it? So why is it that companies want to be providers of a platform uh, and maybe less of an application or why are all or why are applications so often wanting to become platforms for example you can argue that microsoft word is a platform with lots of additional plugins so it's a plat platform for all these plugins and that makes it uh, gives it some platform dynamics or economics well you can get a first idea uh, here by illustration um, a platform uh, is the thing where the applications run on top of it so you can see that there are multiple applications all running on one platform that is the purpose of a platform to support different applications that all can rely on the same functionality and again for that to work you need to have those defined interfaces or standardized, standardized interfaces or at least well-documented interfaces like the Win32 API or the Linux kernel interface or user interface, applications interface. So the software platforms, again, support all these applications. If it's done right, they provide lots of development help to application developers, etc. What a platform provides is basically the functionality to manage the lifecycle of an application startup, shutdown, configuration, connection to a database system, and so forth. And again, by itself, it's useless. Um, it's the applications. But uh, they are valuable in the end because the applications, developers have learned that there will be a platform, so the platform becomes required and necessary part of the uh, equation. And it's actually liked by customers because if they standardize on one platform, they learn or need to manage exactly that one platform. And if then all applications run on top of that one platform, the uh, uh, customers has, customer has lower operations cost because they know how to handle that one platform. And that really turns around, turns around the equation because now Whenever the company, the customer, wants to buy a new application, it uh, implies that the application must run on its platform. So the platform is a given, and that limits the choice of application. And effectively, um, logically speaking, whenever you run the application, then the platform is also run. So whenever someone does an application sale, it implies uh, more usage for the platform, it implies in some form a platform sale. The platform may already be in place, but more usage means more revenue for the platform provider in one way or another. And you can see it here, uh, what it means for prices and revenues. So if there was only one platform and only one application, um, then they might be equally strong. And so um, the um, application provider vendor and the platform vendor get half of the money that a customer can spend but um, it's a platform so it has all these other applications running on top of it and while the applications may vary once it's a word processor then it's a graphics tool and then it's uh, some form processing tool or a compiler or what have you different applications who get sold once each of these sales implies another platform sales so for every application the same platform provider for every new application the same platform provider gets more usage and more revenue while the application only gets its one time 
uh, revenue, uh, even or subscription revenue from the uh, from the vend uh, from the customer. So that's why platforms effectively once in place get sold over and over again implicitly. They're always set, they're always there and any new application increases their usage and ultimately the money the platform provider makes. And in reality, uh, everyone wants to be a platform. So we get layers of platforms. We get say an operating system, we get a database system, we get a web server, all of these to a higher layer in the software stack provide functionalities that others might want to use. The others always hope to grow down, downwards and become a platform or zoop the lower platform, but it's pretty hard. So being a platform is lucrative. Now getting there, becoming a dominant platform is actually not easy. What you need to do is to establish a so-called ecosystem. Uh, when I say platform, it really usually means the piece of software that constitutes the platform. So the code that is Windows, Microsoft Windows or Linux. Now an ecosystem is that platform and all the tooling and the communities and the people around that platform that make it all tick. So the ecosystem is the platform and much more that new entries into a market, new developers of new applications look at and need to make a decision about. Do I want to become part of the Linux ecosystem or do I want to become part of the Windows ecosystem or do I want to become part of both? But if I want to become part of both and I have limited resources, who first? And then is the other one then still worth it and so forth. So software ecosystem, are all the actors uh, and so forth, communities and the relationships around the platform. And the ecosystem is where the final value is. So that's the platform and then there are the applications on top of it. And we face a competition or war among different uh, ecosystems and how and who makes what money. So here you can see on the left um, two competing ecosystems which are different platforms and then different applications. Maybe it's even the, the same application but written for the different platforms and I've drawn them to be of equal size. So uh, for someone wanting to develop a new application it's not immediately key clear on the left side whether ecosystem one or ecosystem two is the one where you would make more money. If the situation changed and that's the war of the ecosystem from the left to the right you would see how ecosystem two seems stronger by which I mean there's the platform like to the left but in ecosystem two there are more applications on that platform than in ecosystem one in that scenario on the right and if that is the case it means that more uh, customers are running the platform of ecosystem 2 and that makes it clear that you typically want your application uh, to first to run on platform uh, of ecosystem 2 because there's simply a larger market there are more customers who require that you be compatible with the platform of ecosystem 2 and hence that's where you go and that's the value of the ecosystem the bigger ecosystem has more to offer in that there are likely to be more customers, meaning your market is bigger and bigger markets to sell into is usually a good thing. Depends on the competitiveness of your product, but usually you go for the larger market because more money is to be made. And that's why the ecosystems compete with each other. Obviously, the ecosystems are driven by the platform provider. And if the platform to provider succeeds in shifting the ecosystems to the right they'll be winning big because there's an ingrained dynamic of application providers wanting to go to ecosystem 2 first or exclusively and then the platform again gains with every application sale it's the richer ecosystem it's the more interesting ecosystem it draws new application um, providers as much as it draws new customers are new users more strongly 
and ecosystem one, which is shrinking. So that's it in this first lecture from me. Uh, we talked about what software is and uh, how it's provided by the software industry, its main players, and we got a first glimpse at software products in general, then different types of software products, most notably platforms and ecosystems uh, and platforms and applications, and then how together they form ecosystems and how that is where the wars in the software industry are. Uh, uh, are done take place thank you very much for your time and attention and see you in the next session